Here we go. So the last minute before the race, Rohan, what are you doing last minute? Oh, having a coffee. Having a coffee one minute before the start. Oh, no, no. It's in, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, probably just chill out on the bus with the guys. Just okay. relaxing a little bit. Uh, most of the time we're just talking a bit of, talking a bit of shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beep. We can't say that. <laughs> good crap. Um, but yeah, just having a bit of fun. Um, before we go to the start line, we're, normally we get to the um, start line five, ten minutes before because it's uh, obviously um unless you're in a jersey you don't you don't get to start on the front so depending oh, yeah, on the, yeah so you can either start at the back or or line up early um yeah. so if it's a windy stage where position is important from kilometer zero it's uh it's an early at least 10 minutes before to start you sitting there on the start I'm waiting it starts very good yeah. okay i want to officially start this now uh, welcome to Wolfie's Talks, Rohan Dennis. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited, Rohan, and thanks for taking the time. Um, you had a fantastic uh, week uh, in Catalonia um, with, with winning a stage. And then as well, you cleaned up the podium with the team, uh, Richie Port um, and, and Adam, Adam Yates. And I, you know, man, I can't remember that anyone really since Mapai 1996 the three people were winning and had three people on the podium from the same team. Can, can you remember any, any event where three people won? No, I remember two, but not three. Okay. Well, <laughs> that, that's a great race. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on Wolfie's Talks. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, yeah. it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I just want to acknowledge you for some of these amazing results that you have been world champion time trial 2018, 2019. You won stages in all the Grand Tours, uh, stages in Tour of Alberta, three stages in the Tour de France, Tour de Suisse. Um, just amazing. You were really, really actively involved in the Giro Italia win last year, um, where you, I think you were most person in TV all time, sitting in the front all the time. So it was just crazy to see you. Even in Catalonia, I saw you all the time uh, being being in the front. So just just an amazing an amazing career you had so far. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's had its ups and downs. I had to be honest with you, but um, I've I've finally found a spot in the sport. I've always enjoyed it, but it's not been obviously no disrespect to any other team I've been in. Um, there's not always been every race we've had a leader that is a potential winner. So um, sometimes in other teams, you go to a race and you're like, okay, let's just see if we can get a stage win. Um, whereas with Ineos, um, Ineos Grenadiers, to be ex yes. correct, um, it's almost every race we've got a guy who can either win or podium by the final stage. So um, that whole that whole thing that I've really enjoyed my, my career is helping people to win. Obviously I love to win myself, but I get just as much joy out of, out of helping others. And, and now I'm in a team where I can almost do that every single time I line up. So that's why you're probably seeing me more, <laughs> more so at the front than, uh, than any other year. It's, it's, it's easy to do my job when there's someone who, um, is able to potentially win every single race I'm in. But this is a lot of pressure. If you have all these guys lined up and you have to work every day and you know everybody expects you to win, this must be crazy. When, when you're in every morning in the bus, they say, okay, you have to go as hard as you can uh, because we have to stay in that jersey. Yes and no. Um, it's a funny thing because in other, other situations, yes, it has been. It has been a little bit of pressure to sort of there's been that, that added pressure of guys, we have to win today. We have to finish this, this job off. We have to, we have to do this because it doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. Sort of thing. Whereas with, um, with Ineos, it does, uh, but that doesn't, that obviously doesn't, didn't happen from word go, but they've got this whole, whole theory of, well, you guys put enough pressure on yourselves to perform. We know you're professional enough to, come here in good shape. You want to be good here. Nobody in this team wants to lose. 
So we're not going to put the added and extra pressure on you to perform because we already know you want to. So you're going to do everything possible to win on the day anyway. So mm -hmm. we're going to give you a tactical way of doing it. Obviously, it's a, it's fluid when you're on the road. You do change a little bit. Okay, that's that isn't exactly what we planned for it to happen. But now we're gonna we're gonna just, okay we're gonna adapt to that. We we make decisions on the road. We adapt what's best for us on the day and and at that at that moment and and then you get the guys obviously in the team like Luke Rowe who's very very good at reading. Okay we've got to just do this. Mm -hmm. We've got to change our way of what we were thinking. Let's do this way now instead of <clears throat> what we, we said in the bus. And it's just about, okay, if things don't go well, then we did our best. The team, the team doesn't, we don't get back into the bus and we don't get absolutely slaughtered, which is <laughs> the best thing ever. Um, I've, I've had it where I've got it back in the bus. I'm like, oh, we're going to get an absolute flogging today. <laughs> we're gonna... This never happens? In not not Neos. No, no. They, they go, oh, they didn't end well. Okay. Like, hey, like that wasn't exactly perfect, but how can we just, what do we do wrong and how can we not do that again? So the culture is a little bit different to what I've had in, in previous times where you just get absolutely flogged for doing the wrong thing instead of it being a learning experience where you go, okay, what did you do wrong and what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again? That's more of how it works in, in Ineos and it's, it works. It's, uh, there's, there's no need to, well, when someone is yelling and screaming, yeah, um, I think 90% of the world just switches off. Switches off. Mm -hmm. So does, yeah, they just don't do it. They just go, okay, let's work this out and don't do it again. <laughs> you said you, you're speaking in the bus and you prepare yourself for, for that day and you make a plan, but then you said it's Luke Rowe, is, is the team team or the team captain on the road and, and he would call the shots and, and you're connected and, yep. and he would say, okay, listen, guys, now we need to action here. This escape group, we need to reel them in and And, and he's, I guess, very respected or, or how, how does this work? You have, you have your say or you just follow when Luke says go, it means go. Um, he's very respected. He, <clears throat> he's sort of the guy, the road captain. So we obviously have our directors telling us what to do um, and what's happening in the front with a breakaway or, or giving us information. And then he makes the call on what we're seeing on the road as well. So we all talk between ourselves <laughs> what do we all think? And then he makes the call and we either say, mm, we don't really agree with that. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm thinking. Or we go, okay, let's just do it, execute it. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Or sometimes even in Catalonia, I was like, I, I didn't think that, that we did the right thing. It worked out well, but... I thought there was a better way of doing it, but you just have to um, go, okay, it's not a, um, a dictatorship. It's a, um, it's almost a vote on the road. What do we all think? And majority wins. Okay. So it's, uh, it's more or less, well, I've lost this vote. There's no point crying about it. Yes. I can be concerned that the vote went the wrong way. I'd still believe what I said was right, but I'm going to try execute the new tactics as best as possible. And I hope they were right. I hope they were right. <laughs> um, but yeah. You had a great season 2020 and obviously it ended as well on a high personally with that win of that Texmar Gonzalez prize from the team. So it really feels like with Ineos, you really found a home and, and, and a team which really understands you as a rider. And it, it, as you described it, I think it's just so nice to hear that this works so well. So can you tell us a bit about this prize? To be honest, I didn't know how, um, how much weight it held and how, how much of a... Uh, an honor it sort of was to actually win that prize. So um, 
it's uh, the most outstanding teammate award, which I actually didn't think I would have won that. I voted for other guys who were um, solid all year round and not just for a, a small period of the season. I, I thought, ah, oh, like I look at it as that. And then when I was one of the final guys and I was like, oh, well, that's weird. I'll probably, I probably won't win it anyway. And then they said, <laughs> I won it. And, it was, it was a nice surprise, to be honest with you. So it's all voted by teammates and staff mm -hmm. members. So that's, it's not by general public or a panel. Um, so that it was a nice little, like, like I said, it was a nice way of just saying, Rowan, we actually, we accept you. Mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't always been obviously in the past hasn't always been uh, noted that I'm the easiest to work with, even though I don't agree with that, but um, to have the recognition from your peers that they thought you were the best teammate for the year is actually quite an honor. Um, uh, and it's, it sits quite proud in, in the living area, just over there. Um, <clears throat> Not many trophies sit or awards sit in around in in uh, in public in my house, so it's something that I I really do actually take pride in that one. Very nice. Okay, well done. And it's the first year in the team, and I think it's really nice that, that this happened. Yeah, so fantastic. Yeah, well well done. Thanks, mate. We we have a clip prepared just to give people a bit of an idea about your career, and it's just a, a minute long, and maybe I'm I'm sure you will recognize some of the things, and we're going to speak about it. So. Um, just I ask my, my lovely daughter Anna Sophie to start the video. So we'll see if this works. Wow, so cool. <laughs> a few good memories there. Yeah, it's very good. I thought we took we took a few clips from the past, so I think it, it just brings back some some good memories for you. Um, I want to take you even further back with your memories to to the beginning. Where where does it all start? Uh, I know you were swimming a lot, soccer, but where did it start that you created such a passion for cycling? Uh, I was about fourteen, so um, there's a a program in in Australia, but where I'm from is Adelaide, South Australia. So I think there might only, there was one of these programs in each state of Australia. I think there's only one in South Australia and Perth now, but I might be wrong. Um, they go around to your school, the State Institute of Sport, mm -hmm. or not all the schools, but a lot of the schools in the state. And they test you for fitness, like the beat test or shuttle run. Um, mm -hmm. They they test your or measure your body, uh, your arm length and whatnot, and just do general fitness um, tests to see if you're suited to the sports they're trying to really target. So they were trying to target, from memory, it was rowing, cycling, uh, soccer, football, um, <laughs> European as well. Uh, and I think it was, weirdly, it was um, pole vault was one of them, which I thought was more of a skill sport, yeah. not a general physiology sport. So um, I was a little bit disappointed that they said that I was really suited to cycling. 
I'm like, oh, come on. Could have picked a better sport than that. Rowing would have been way cooler than that. And I'm thinking cycling, come on. I'm not going to walk around in tights. But weirdly, I was walking around in Speedos. So it was actually putting more clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> but socially, it wasn't as acceptable. Um, so they give you uh, one year of free coaching equipment and obviously clothing just to sort of see how you like it. Mm-hmm. If you don't like it, you can give it all back. No charge. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for trying. No, no skin off our nose. So I thought, oh, look, I'll use it as a bit of cross training for mm-hmm. muscling. I had no leg muscle. Uh, I probably needed to work on it a little bit more for swimming and, and my kick. So I thought, why not? about three, four months in, I uh, had the tough conversation with my parents <laughs> and said, look, I know it's been 11 years in the pool, but I don't want to swim anymore. Um, so that didn't go down so well, <laughs> um, but I'm a little bit hard headed. And obviously they weren't, they weren't trying to stop me from cycling. They were just trying, they were a little bit concerned that I was just jumping away from swimming and something that I'd worked at for 11 years, more or less, um, at the whim that I, I just enjoyed this new sport. So they wouldn't let me just quit swimming. They said, look, you have to keep swimming um, and riding a bike. My swimming coach didn't actually know that I was cycling at this point. Um, And then about, I reckon it was probably two weeks later, they said, look, we can see you don't like swimming anymore Mm -hmm. and stop if you want. So I made a a target of one more um, swim meet, uh, like an A grade or whatever it was. Um, And it said, look, this is my last one. And I was 15 and said, this is it, done. Um, and I haven't looked back. I think I've been in the pool twice since then. I know you've been in the pool in Dubai with your son. Yeah, but not actually, (laughs) not actually swimming, doing laps. I I was in twice before, um, nationals and under 17s because I, I had an injury with my knee and my coach at that point said, you know how to swim, right? I said, yeah, he goes, go swim in the pool. Mm-hmm. that's how you that's how you can train because you can't ride a bike at the moment your knee is obviously too sore to ride so go swim and i was like oh i don't really want to do this <laughs> so uh uh yeah that was pretty well the last time i did any laps in the pool and i haven't looked back to be honest with you it's been it's been a roller coaster but a good one very good. You think that the swimming in the pool and kind of being on your own, that did helped you with time trialing later on in your career, that you, what, where you became such a strong time trialist? 100%. Mm-hmm. Can't argue with that at all. It's um, every swimming event is a time trial, a lot shorter than mm-hmm. most time trials on the road bike, but it's essentially just, I built this motor, um, uh, breathing and and heart and everything from such a young age and yeah. it's all about pacing so basically that's that's what i built my body to do and uh it's not an unfair advantage because i still get beaten <laughs> but um yeah it's it's 100 percent the reason why i think i am as good as what i am at, at time trials mm-hmm you spoke about your parents and, and that they were very supportive. Any, any things from your parents you still kind of cherish today that you said, this is something they've given me on my way? Um, <clears throat> so my dad was into uh, go-karting and a lot of racing um, at an international level as a junior as well. So, and my mum was uh, into netball, basketball. She she didn't take it as seriously, but she was still quite active. But one thing that I noticed what, what my dad said was he, he really regretted throwing, not throwing the towel in, but just sort of um, 
when he got to as like late teens, he he didn't really have that passion for it, and mm-hmm. it's not so much a regret, but he he just still wonders where it could have gone. Mm-hmm. So he told me that at a young age, and and it's always always stuck in my mind of well, I don't really want to have that that thought in my head of what if and it's it's a big reason why i tried gc at one point Mm -hmm. i didn't want to have that what if when i retired from professional cycling of Mm -hmm. i could have been a gc rider what if i tried Mm -hmm. well now i've tried i don't enjoy it Mm -hmm. and i'm like well i tried it didn't enjoy it so cool there's no what if there anymore so <clears throat> that that drive has come um i don't think on purpose from my parents yeah. uh, i think they were just they were sharing their experiences in life and i thought well I, like i could see it hurt dad sometimes thinking mm-hmm. of what if what could have been and uh i just thought i i don't i don't really want that feeling um so they've really um, inadvertently put that uh, in my mind and and help me push further than what I probably would have if I didn't know that I think so that's a big big thing mm-hmm. big thing very good if you come home uh, to your mom to Australia uh, and and when she asks you what should she cook for you what's your favorite meal for mom <laughs> god just a good old Aussie barbecue to be honest with barbecue. you Okay, yeah, that's just something good. something simple. Uh, look, we have it in Europe as well, but it's just different when you're in when you're with your family. Um, some good Aussie wine, uh, you can't beat it. You Very really good. can't beat it. Yeah. Very good. You're a you have a family yourself. You have a son and a daughter. I think fairly recently, your daughter Madeline. Yep. Uh, and your wife um, as well. She was a professional cyclist and an Olympian. Yep. Um, on, on the track for Australia. Can Correct. she beat you in a sprint? Can she take you? I, uh, I'd like to, I like to give her a little bit of stick sometimes. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a sprinter myself, but somehow I've got a sprint on me. <laughs> so, um, I, I made a bet with her once. I don't remember if she actually, she achieved it, but I said, if you can, if you can do a sprint, Uh, over a thousand watts for a certain amount of time um (laughs) like i made some sort of bet uh, because i know i can do that while seated not even getting out the saddle so (laughs) um and i had the same bet with omar you know omar (laughs) that's how we met but uh yeah it's it's always a a nice little little bit of fun i have uh because a lot of people don't really think Obviously, I'm more of a time trawler and uh, climber, all rounder. So, um, and she was actually a road sprinter and teens pursuit on the track. So, um, I like to poke a little bit of fun at her every now and then. For, obviously, in all in good fun, but um, yeah, I'm sure if she was here, she'd uh, she'd give me a bit a bit of back, but. <laughs> not here, so I can I can speak freely. Can talk. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. Very good. What do you think, Rohan? How much of your success is your talent you've gotten from your parents, and how much is hard work? Um, I'm always someone who says uh, talent only gets you so far, and especially in cycling. So, um, swimming. One thing that let's go back to the swimming point. Um, to sort of give you a bit of reference there is swimming is it really depends on how you can float which comes down to how what your body shape and mm-hmm. your uh, your makeup is uh, so you le- need a little bit more fat you're if you're a leaner person you don't float as well that's a very basic way of looking at it um but with cycling you can see someone as small as uh my teammate sosa mm-hmm. about i reckon he's 50 kilos when he's dripping wet Mm-hmm. And then you have guys like Garner, also on the same team, uh, 85 kilos, and they're racing the same race. Mm-hmm. So um, cycling is a sport, and I was told this at my first race, where uh, it's a sport 
the amount of effort you put in, you get back. Yeah. And that's been that that's been something that I've remembered also from well from my first race. So that really, really made me happy when I heard that. Mm-hmm. Really happy because mm-hmm. I was sick and tired of of uh, going to swimming training and being one of the guys or one of the anybody there who trained the hardest. Mm-hmm. I'd go to nationals and just get absolutely flogged. Um, I think my best result was 10th in uh, my age group at nationals. And then there'd be other people who would train half as hard as me and they'd get a medal or they'd get top 10 in everything. Um, and it really frustrated me. So there's, there is an element early on where talent does get you somewhere, but after that, it's, it's all hard work. There's not a single person in the pro peloton who gets an easy win now, not mm-hmm. a single person. Um, there might have been in the back in the day, but there was also other things in play back then. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I think anybody in, who knows anything about cycling history will uh, will have a little bit of a laugh about that one. Um, but yeah, there's definitely talent early and then hard work late. Mm, very good, very good, and it's good for life. Yeah, I think if you learn this lesson in sport, I think you can. You can pass this on in life. Take us back to 2015, uh, Tour de France, stage number one. Uh, you go on the start line, uh, prologue, time trial. Yep. How was that? Um, do you know how many uh, second places I got in time trials before oh, that? Right. <laughs> no, I didn't check. Yeah. 10. Okay, 10. 10 second places to seven different people. Okay. Um, so not a single time trial win as a pro for two and a half years. And I'm thinking, I know I've done all the work, but who's going to beat me today? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who's going to beat me? Mm-hmm. And I finished and they said, that's a new, a new uh, Tour de France um, average speed record. I'm like, okay, cool. So someone else is going to take that from me today. So I sat around for, for, I think it was two hours or more. Um, obviously, I couldn't have a shower because of doping control. Okay. Um, you have to do that before you can have a shower. Uh, so, And I didn't need to go to the toilet. So I'm like, this is awesome. It's 35 degrees. Uh, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm shaking. Uh, this is obviously after the race. And I'm thinking, until the last last person comes across that line i don't care if it's quintana i don't care if it's a a 30 30 kilo um 10 year old i do not trust that i've won until the last person's finished so um it was a very um it was a it was a shock to me uh i was thrown in a deep end obviously it's one thing winning a time trial or a race as a pro it's another thing wearing the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. Mm-hmm. And that's basically just what happened. And there was a lot of attention. I was not ready for it. Mm-hmm. I was not ready for it all at all. So I was uh, overwhelmed. I got back to my room that night and I was by myself for a bit. And I just sat in the corner and I was almost just like, I, I don't know if I want to go to dinner. I, I don't want to be around anybody. I just want to sit here by myself and and just chill out. My phone was going, obviously you got your phone going crazy as well. And I'm like, I just, I put it aside and I was just, I was just sitting there just going, I don't know if I want this. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want it. It's It was a weird, very weird feeling. Super and the weird. next day when you were then riding, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's unbelievable. When you put in that jersey, you go on the start line and then you have a whole day, hopefully to enjoy uh, the jersey and cruising to the up and down in the peloton just that everybody sees you. How was that day? Uh, it, was, it was surreal to start with. You obviously, I was riding through Utrecht um, and just the goosebumps um, of everyone cheering and 
and they're not necessarily cheering for me because I'm not Dutch. Uh, Tom Dumoulin's next to me in the white jersey. They're probably cheering for him, going, uh, screw this guy. He's Aussie. You beat the, our, young, our young Dutch. Uh, uh, up <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, uh, like, they're probably not even cheering for me. Uh, but it, it gave me goosebumps when I was there. It was, it was overwhelming again. Um, but as soon as that that flag dropped, it was back to business again. And mm-hmm. I um, I actually lost a jersey that day through being a good teammate, um, more or less. And uh, I even got a bit of stick uh, from the team when I got back to the bus for, for losing it. And, mm-hmm. and it was kind of a bit weird. I didn't understand it because I was like, but I did the right thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, but the yellow jersey is such a huge thing for a sponsor to keep mm-hmm. each day. That even though I did the right thing by the team and our team GC leader, which was TJ Van Garderen, mm-hmm. um, the team was still stressed about obviously giving back to our sponsor. Obviously, yeah. And I was like, well, that's not really my job. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I like I've only just recently realised that, but mm-hmm. um, there's a lot more to wearing that yellow jersey than just being the leader of the race. It's a I've been told seventy percent of the revenue is made during July at the Tour de France for all the teams for all the teams. And if you're wearing the yellow jersey, that gets the attention, huge attention. So uh, sponsors will will bend over and almost kiss your feet if you wear it for more than one day. Um, whereas for me, it, it wasn't really a concern. I wore it one day, two days is, is the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was actually quite happy to pass the attention away. <laughs> so uh, um, it was uh, it was an experience. Well, well done. Yeah, great. When you time trial... <clears throat> What's going through your head? I know you have something with the number five um, and you have a, a special thing ongoing there. So, but tell us what it is. If you, if you really push to your absolute, absolute limit uh, for, for up to an hour, what's going through your head? How can you sustain that? Um, counting to five is almost a distraction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll always be checking my power. I know my... Um, my plan for the day, uh, what I need to generally hold for each section, uphill, downhill, flats, to keep it real simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but while I'm obviously doing that, instead of just thinking about the pain, and I do it at training as well, it just sort of distracts me. I count my pedal strokes. Um, and it can be just basically the white lines, between the white lines, people's driveways, uh, shadows, wet roads, anything. Um, mm. And I tr- it's, it's more or less to try and not think about the pain. Mm-hmm. Um, the only other thing I have thought about that's been really, really stuck in my mind was in Yorkshire. I was thinking about more or less everything that isn't materialistic in my life. So funnily enough, I was having quite a hard time obviously during that period. Um, But it came to a realization that that's all the things in my life that were good were what actually mattered, which was Mm -hmm. my family. Mm -hmm. And that was really stuck in my mind along with counting, of course, because it's just sort of second nature to count throughout pretty well that whole time trial. Um, funnily enough, it's still the best time trial I've, I've ever had, uh, which really just comes back down to me being happy. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> weird one. They talk about happy watts. Yes. Uh, it's actually a thing. It's, mm-hmm. There's no doubt in my mind. When you're happy, you're happy to suffer. Mm. When you're not happy, you just want to get out of there as quick as possible. So it's 
it's a mindset I think in time trials that I need to try and find a way to tap into every single time and mm. then also figure out how to get into it during a road race as well <laughs> but it's a little bit less cutthroat in a road race Yes, but when did it start with the counting? And I think you count as well on your fingers. You, you, yeah, I do. I do when I'm sitting here, I just do patterns on my with my fingers but <laughs> in fives. Um, and if I can't get a multiple of five, it's say like 23, two plus three is five, or 41, 46. It can go on forever. Um, but, <laughs> uh, It all started because of my bloody brother. Okay. okay. Uh, he said the sound on the TV must be in a multiple of five. Okay. <laughs> Only five, 10, 15, 20. And if it's five or 10 and it's slightly too loud, deal with it. All right. <laughs> or if it's slightly too, yeah, you just have to deal with it. And, I was, and initially it really cracked me. And then after a while, it, it just sort of slowly grew and grew and grew over the years into something that I can't stop doing now. I'll do it when I stand up from this couch after this podcast. I'll stand up and I'll walk five steps between certain things. And it's almost become an OCD. So I've got my brother to blame. <laughs> Older brother, I guess. Yep. I, he did a lot of things. He even said to me one day, there's, there's spiders underneath the toilet seat I, i i reckon i i lifted that toilet seat every time I went to the toilet for years for years and I he'll get your pain i have three older brothers all right and they play games with you they it it haunted me i flipped my my pillow for it was a good eight years i flipped my pillow from one side to the other to check if there was a spider underneath every night um creepy crawly ones in australia <clears throat> yeah i had it actually there was once there was a spider underneath my pillow and i was like thank christ i looked uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was only once and i was like well at least at least it, something good came out of that but <laughs> yeah and um, so you are now 12 years in the peloton and obviously have been been a, a long time around um 12 years 11 years? Oh, no, this... That's nine? I went pro in 2013, but I was in Europe since 2009. Okay, yes. Yeah, no. yeah so technically you could have called me pro back then, but I, I wouldn't call myself pro until 2013. Okay. <laughs> but now you have obviously younger riders with the team. Do you feel it has changed a lot in the last couple of years? And, and what did you learn now from the young riders coming into the game? Is this any different or what can, what did you learn from them and what do you teach them when they come uh, into the peloton? They teach me I'm getting old. Okay. <laughs> Even though I'm only 30, nearly 30, 30 yes. which is not actually that old. Um, But these young guys are really impressive and it's sometimes really hard to keep up with them. It's uh, it, I, and I think the biggest thing to blame, not to blame, but to, to point out is that they're probably doing a lot of things as if they're pro from mid teens. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long their life will be in pro cycling or if mm -hmm. it's going to become a much younger person's sport it may not i may be completely wrong there um but they come in ready to go from age of 20 21 uh no one ever thought that podger mm -hmm. would be the winner of the tour de france last year yes and he absolutely like obviously he didn't dominate the whole thing but he absolutely mm -hmm. destroyed everyone on the last day mm -hmm. um And he's been doing exactly that in every single race that he wants to target since then. So, and then there's obviously Remco. Um, he's had a bit of a tough time since Lombardia last year, yeah. but yeah. nobody would have said that he would have got second or a 19-year-old would have got second in a 
50, uh, 52 or 53 kilometer time trial mm -hmm. as a 19 year old in the pro peloton at a world championships. No one would have said a 19 year old would do that. Um, so I think there's a huge movement and I even saw a little bit when I was younger where obviously power meters and, and whatnot came into play. And, uh, when I came into the pro peloton, they, they laughed that I had a, a power meter from the age of, I think it was 18 or 17 <laughs> when they were getting them at the same time as me, almost when they were mid late twenties um, or early thirties even. So there's no doubt that the specific training has played a huge part in, in the earlier development of, of cyclists and, and that's why they're so good. They're, they're looking into their nutrition, their training and everything from probably 14, 15 onwards, like, mm. like they're a pro. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And the teams will help them to guide. Um, what do you think is the biggest upcoming talent? You mentioned two riders already. Anybody else we should have a look? Oh, that's a really, really, oh, Pitcock. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Tom Pitcock. Um, There's, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's in Lotto Yumbo, I think. Voss, I think it's Voss. Mm -hmm. um, I think he won the baby Giro and he's now a Neo Pro. I, and there's a bit of talk about, oh, if he doesn't win the a Grand Tour this year, he's failed because that's what someone else has done in the same shoes or, or Bernal had done oh. as well. And I'm like, Phew. Like it's not obviously joking, but, yes. um, oh, but was... that's sort of the, the same trajectory and that people expect it. Um, but I still think it's, there's still beneficial. Uh, let's put it like this. Messi was in the La Liga or the, the top league, probably from 18 or 17. If you want to be the Messi, Yes you probably have to be in the top league of football from that age, but mm -hmm. you can still have a very successful career. Yeah. You can grow at 23, very successful. Um, you may just not win as much or as big a races as them and as consistently. Uh, so that's, That's where I put put cycling is it's sort of moving towards that. You get these huge superstars and then you have the rest who are super good mm -hmm. and people would aspire to be them, but they're not going to be on the cover of, well, we don't really have magazines anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> The big magazines are not going to be on the cover and people aren't going to idolize them as much, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. What's the race, your favorite race, and which race you would like to win? <clears throat> Pick one. Oh, I'd love to win Roubaix, but I'm probably never going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm never going to probably go, probably going to win it. Um, my favorite race, and unfortunately, it's not on the calendar anymore, is California. Okay. Um, I love America. Okay. American racing is fun. It, uh, it's enjoyable. It's more relaxing. Mm. Um, my coach is from there. Uh, I've got, I've got friends in America. I understand how everything works there. It's, it's not as stressful. It's, it's still hard, yeah. but you can actually enjoy your racing and, and, And you might get your head kicked in one day by some of these, these smaller teams or you go, who the hell is this? Yes. Not even pro. How did they make me hurt? This is, yeah. Um, but you can still enjoy that. Whereas if you have a bad day in Europe, oh, you're getting dropped. <laughs> you're out, you're out the back and you're like, I hope I make time limit. So, uh, Yeah, California unfortunately isn't on the on the race program anymore, and it's I think it's a huge loss. Okay, like, yeah. My my favorite race since 
since a Neo Pro. Um, I've always, except for the two years I did the Giro, 17 and 18, I've always tried to go to um, California. It, I've always pushed for it. No, I want to go. I want to go Cali, Cali, Cali. Um, so yeah, if I could retire at that race, obviously it's it's in May, so it's a bit of a bit of retirement. I wish it was <laughs> in September. Um, and if it was still on the on the program, I'd say Cali's my race to retire at. Um, sorry, Tour Down Under, but uh, yeah, <laughs> and that would be even earlier if you retired Tour Down Under. That would be even even worse. Are you just to this at the finish and and yeah. Yeah, and also tour down under, you'd have to do a full preseason as if you're a pro. Yes. Just for one month. Of, yes. no, I, think. I don't really want to do that. Yes. Very good. <laughs> if you would give yourself advice going back to your beginning, 2009, 2010, and, and what you know today, what tip would you give yourself? Uh, be patient. Mm. Um, in my first two years or two and a half years as a pro, I was really impatient with um, with results coming instantly. So I obviously said that I had 10 second places and I think three third places um, in time trials uh, in my first two and a half years. And one of my last things I said uh, to Mickey Shah, who's one of the best teammates you ever have, um, Uh, he said to me in Tour of Belgium, don't worry, mate, The next, your first win will be just around the corner or, or something along those lines. And I said, I don't want to hear what you've got to say unless you can tell me when that'll be. Mm. Um, now, that was, on, uh, that was actually the 27th of May, um, 2015. He said that to me. Um, I remember that because day two was my birthday. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah that was more or less a month before my first win and it's it's something I didn't oh, I'm still learning patience I'm not very patient even at 30 um, I like things done almost yesterday uh, when I'm like I wish that was done yesterday um, so be patient um, the adaptation will come over the years, you will get stronger. You will not suffer as much as you are now in your first six months of being a cyclist and don't, and don't think this sport isn't for you just because you're getting piped every day. Um, things will turn around. Very good. I, I try to remember this when I go on my ride. I'm 50 now, so I'm, I, I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you might be a little bit past it i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much yeah um speaking about the time trial bike and your setup anything special any gadget or anything you're always going to have on every bike and something you're really particular about about the setup on your bike uh position mm -hmm. so one thing that really really ruins me as a time trial is my position if it's wrong i'm instantly a c grader mm -hmm. i'm I a period of my of my life 2011 I was with Riverbank Continental and my position was more or less two centimeters too low in the front end so um, more or less locking off my hip flexor and all my power mm -hmm. I I beat Luke Durbridge in an individual pursuit which is four kilometers by I think it was nine seconds um, on my I'll say on the track bike I went onto the road. There was a four kilometer prologue and he beat me. I think there was a, I think it was 19 seconds. He beat me by something like that. It was something ridiculous. And I could not figure it out for the whole season. Almost. I could not figure it out. And then the track coach saw um, a very small clip of me going past on my bike. And he said, you're just too low put up two centimeters in the front, put up two centimeters and my next time trial, I got second. Um, and instantly I've realized that if my position is wrong, my body doesn't work correctly. It doesn't matter if I have the quickest wheels, quickest mm -hmm. helmet, skin suit, bike, doesn't matter. I will not win. Um, mm -hmm. 
So the first thing I I try to really nail down on it on any Tantra bike, uh, new old same model but new frame position. Mm-hmm. Get the position exactly the same, and then let's work on the other little one percenters from there. Mm-hmm. What crank lengths are you using? Uh, one seven five. One seven five. Yeah. Okay. okay. Slightly okay. longer than my road bike. One seventy two and a half. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, very good. And you felt when you were too low in the front that that created an issue, and then um, because you hip flexors, you we were just too too closed up. Yep. So it's it's not always the same for everybody. You mm-hmm. see, on Du Milan, he's super low in the front and can still yeah. get the power out. Mm-hmm. So it's always it's very individual when it comes to position wise. Uh, for me, even on the road bike, you'll see I'm more upright than other pros. Uh, mm-hmm. Other people have tried to change that road position to make me more aero um, yeah. and only ended bad. Um, so uh, comfort uh, creates power for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not unflexible, but the, the muscles that create the power for me are really needing to be open. <laughs> If to be very, very, very simple about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good. We work a lot with shorter cranks now. We see this is a bit of a trend and I went I went 165 on my road bike, obviously being a bit older, flexibility is, is not so good, but it, that, that really opened up my hips and it was really uh, quite something interesting from 172.5 to 165, which I did. Which um, we have also tried as well, but it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a feeling that I didn't like. Mm-hmm. Um, so I trialed 170 mil cranks and mm-hmm. it felt too snappy to um, like, I didn't have that power mm-hmm. also and that leverage and it does, the leverage isn't, there's not much leverage extra like with mm-hmm. the five mil yes. or whatnot, but it's the feeling wasn't there. So um, I had that for a couple of months and I said, no, nah, this isn't for me. And let's just go back to, to what I had, which was 175s, and I haven't looked back. So, um, sorry? It seems to work for you, yeah? You, you just want to... Yeah, it. there are a couple of guys who have said, this is amazing, I yes. love it. Uh, I wish I had this back 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. But there's a there's still a small group of us that just, uh, just doesn't feel right. So... Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to be in the sport for another 10 years. So um, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, I'll suffer if it, if it really is a detrimental effect for me. Um, I don't think it's going to be a huge factor in, uh, in my life uh, when I retire. <laughs> to be honest with you. We've all gone to COVID uh, the last, last year now almost. Uh, anything you you take from it which really affected your life in, in a very positive way and you say listen that, that is good and I, I I really learned this and I want to keep this and I hope everyone kind of keeps going with this um it's a weird one because I hate masks mm-hmm. I, I really hate wearing a mask it, especially when it's hot mm-hmm. and I'm in two minds I've spoken about it with a lot of my teammates and And there is, obviously, there is a beneficial effect with keeping sicknesses out when you travel. Yeah. Um, so I'm in two minds when all of this eventually passes, not sure how long, um, if, if I'm going to still keep the mask or not. Mm-hmm. Okay. For traveling, maybe. Yeah, for traveling and maybe some sanitizer for the plane and stuff. So I think that's maybe a good thing. Yeah. And you guys travel a lot. Yeah, you, you, you're exposed yeah. to so much more than a normal person is. Yeah, exactly. So it's a little bit, I'm, I'm just not sure if when I travel, obviously wearing these still little, still little tubes stacked mm-hmm. in like sardines um, in a tin. And there is is a very high chance that someone on that plane is going to be sick with something. And if you're training uh, 20, 30 hours a week and, and your immune system is suppressed because you're a little bit under the weather, or just yeah. a little bit tired more or less, yeah. and um, you get close to them, it's, it's very easy to ruin your, your preparation until a very important event. So 
it might just be something our team says, look, we suggest you wear a mask mm -hmm. when you travel. You don't have to when you're at the in the race or whatnot, but when you travel, why risk it? So there's, I think that as professional athletes, it might be a huge um, positive and and something that's yeah, it's annoying. It's it feels you get hot and whatnot, but when you're putting so much effort in, it might just be worth it for that that three hours of your life of that day. Mm. just to, just to risk you wouldn't, you wouldn't eat off food yes. would you? No, so no. um there's if you can minimize the risk of getting sick before a huge event or any event um that's that's awesome very good speaking about traveling and and when you obviously have a lot of time at the airport who do you follow on instagram who is your top uh, three picks uh who you always check out first? Uh, I, I actually don't check many people. I've, I follow way too many meme pages. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I, I don't think a lot of them are appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can care later. Honest. Yeah, you send me on WhatsApp. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, look, there's a lot of dark humor I quite like, uh, but curious peter so um family guy okay um peter peter griffiths off of a, a family guy that's one that just it's it's pushing the edge um that they jump the line i think in every single episode and they push it and push it but you just can't help but laugh um so that's one i think that's sort of socially acceptable to say that's um <laughs> too far um but it's still on tv so um i can laugh at it <laughs> you. be honest with you so curious peter um and the rest i think if someone goes on to my uh, i'm not private so i'm sure they could find everybody i'm following um uh, i'm sure people bring up the fact that are you troll cyclist um don't know uh <laughs> but uh yeah I, i'm i quite enjoy just flicking through my news feed and and having a laugh to be honest with you it's what social media should be for just having a good laugh i saw you playing basketball and then i think the ball bounced back and and unfortunately hit your son and but you you took him in the mini i think you're a big fan of your mini i um, love it you took him for a drive technically it's not my mini it's uh <laughs> melt it's my wife's mini but um Yeah, it's funny thing about that video about me hitting him in the face with the ball. Uh, it wasn't the first time, but it wasn't also planned. <laughs> oh, was, it wasn't planned. You could see the bounce, bump, bump, and then <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, he um, he loves cars, uh, loves them. So it's it's hard to say no to him. Drive down the driveway with him. Okay, mate, I've got to actually go now. You can't be sitting on my lap um, while I'm driving on the streets in a car that only has an airbag as a driver. Um, it's it's unsafe even for one person probably. So, yeah, I think, look, we might have a bit of an issue when he grows up with cars. Um, it'll be that or bikes. It's... I think yeah, he sees us or sees me most of the time every day ride a bike and I'm not going to stop him from doing it, but uh, I'm not going to push him towards it because it is a sport that um, it's not easy. <laughs> it's a, it can be very, uh, very um, rewarding, but also painful at the same time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it can. Yes, it can. <laughs> um, you, move, you moved to Dubai, what, 20, 30 years 20 ago? Years, 20 years ago. Well, next year was 20 years anniversary. Yeah. So uh, obviously to be in the bike industry and build the bike industry in Dubai. So I'm, I've no doubt you understand the old, the pain of trying to get a different culture involved with the sport, um, let alone um, someone who enjoys the sport themselves to enjoy it when yeah. they start to hurt. 
<laughs> it has been great. You know, I mean, for us, really, it has been a great time and seeing the sport growing from, from strength to strength every year, getting more people into the sport, the sport we love so much. And it, it's really become a big thing. It's become a big thing all over the world, but now in UE with the team and, and everything. And it's just fantastic. To, we love the sport so much and seeing more and more people participating in it has been really, uh, really great for us. And you've got competition now. Ah, wait. competition is good, you know what I mean? Uh, who, do, who do you consider yourself the biggest competition? Who, who motivated you to go further and harder in your training? Who was in your mind when you, when you were training? Or you were self-intrinsically motivated? Definitely not Omar. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, come on. <laughs> he, he's out of his career now, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, weirdly enough, I, I didn't have anybody... Uh, in my mind from like pro peloton when i was younger yeah. it was a lot of guys close to me in my age group um and it, it might sound weird there was a guy that uh you may actually remember his name jack bobridge yes um so i i came through a sport majority like really track based as a young rider and he was the next big thing he mm. was he was the one who changed records. He was the guy who everyone thought was going to be the, the one who brought Australia the, the gold medal in, in teams pursuit, et cetera, individual, if it was still in road career that just went in one trajectory. Um, and I was always in the shadow. Mm -hmm. I was one year younger. I wanted, I wanted to be, better than him from word go. Um, I wanted to be as good instantly and then knock him off his perch. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was a huge drive, huge mm -hmm. drive as a young kid um, to have someone who was from the same state. We trained together and, um, from probably one year in of my of my career um and i could i could really just put him in front of me and go okay this is what i have to do to beat him mm. because i know he's going somewhere in this sport so if i can be better than him that's it's only going to end well for me and it did end well for me um that was that was obviously early. Then you get to Europe and you go, oh, there's a bigger world than just Jack Bobridge. There's a bigger world than just Cycling Australia or Track Nationals or Junior Worlds. You're like, wow, I was I thought that was the big league. I had no idea. Um, I knew of guys like Lance Armstrong, but they're so far away. They're mm -hmm. so far away. They're just untouchable. That you. When you're in Australia, you're not even like, oh, I didn't watch anything but the Tour de France. And even then, I'd probably only watched half of it. I just understood that he won. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. Oh, Lance is the best rider in the world. Who is, and no offense, Stuart O'Grady. Who is Stuart O'Grady? Mm -hmm. And he was, he was a huge rider. He was one of the guys who won gold medals. He was from my hometown. But... I was so removed from the professional cycling that, yeah, I didn't know much about it until I, I moved to Europe. And it's, it was just the way it was. It might not be like that now, but it, it definitely was when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Who do you think will win the tour in 2021? They just set me up. They just set me up. For that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's too hard to pick. It's just too hard to pick. Um, look, you saw us in Catalonia. We have a really strong team. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk that Podjakar and, and Roglic were not there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're huge players. So with very strong, well, Roglic has a very strong team. Podjakar has not as strong a team, but he seems to back it up by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Look, it'll be it'll be between Ineos, Jumbo Visma, and uh, UAE. Okay. Um, 
it'll be one of those teams. I know that's spreading it pretty thin, yes. but unless all of our GC, Roglic, Podjakar, and all of our GC guys crash out, I don't see another team winning the Tour de France this year. Mm. Very good. Very good. <laughs> If you're going to write a book about your career, what's going to be the title of the book? Um, oh. All or nothing. <laughs> nothing? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I say all or nothing because generally I, I'll either do something to my best ability or I just won't do it at all. Mm -hmm. um, unless, okay, there's sometimes I don't do something to my absolute best ability, but it's because I go, oh, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. So obviously not like get in trouble or... I've got a job to do. Um, it may, I'll do what I'm told to do. Um, I'll do my job for that day that I've been told to do, but um, it's, it's not going to change my life or the outcome of the team's race if I do any more. Um, so for example, um, say we need to bring a break back in a race um, because there's a, there's a dangerous GC right up the road. Okay, I can bring the break back, but then I'm not going to keep riding on the road, on the front. Mm. No point wasting energy and doing more and more. I'm just going to sit back and save energy for another day. So best of my ability, um, I could keep riding on the front all day, but that's not the point. That's yeah. the, no point in doing it so oh, i don't know if that would be the that's just that's basically the way i i live my life i either do it 100 or i don't do it at all or Maybe. i do it <laughs> just do the bare minimum which my teachers would agree with in school <laughs> yeah very good if you if you go to a karaoke bar what song you're going to pick um One that someone else will sing with me, so I don't have to do all the singing. All, all by yourself. So team <laughs> teammate. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, uh, like the last time I was at karaoke, and I think, oh, what is in Japan in 2019? Um, after Worlds, actually, with two, two of my mates. And uh, I don't remember a whole lot of that, the period when I was at the karaoke bar, um, which is a good thing because... <laughs> I'm no Celine Dion or a John Travolta. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> um, I am definitely not a singer or a dancer. And it's good that I can't remember that. But yeah, it has to be a very um, intoxicated night for me to get up on, up on stage. I'm not a uh, uh, poor extrovert when it comes to that thing, that sort of thing. Maybe next time we, co we come to Dubai, maybe we, we try it out. It's an expensive drink when you get to Dubai. That. <laughs> okay. It's not cheap to drink there. <laughs> And if you could spend a day with someone or swap your life with someone dead or alive, who would it be? You can spend a day with some famous person, anyone, either live their life or just spend a day with them. I've, I wouldn't swap my life, but I would like to spend a day with... Um, Oh, Ricky Gervais. Okay, he's funny. Okay, very, very good. Yeah. That's a good laugh. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine. But there's also a bit of me who wants to learn something as well. And he's he's obviously not stupid. He's a very smart guy and he's he'd be fun to be around. He'd probably have to get to know you or warm up to yes. you to really start to be funny. Um, there's a, a big part of me that wants to learn. And I'm, uh, oh, I think, someone like Warren Buffett there's so much, so much you could learn from him. I don't know if I'm sm quite smart enough to take it all in in one day, but you could, you could at least record it. Yes. If you could record it, then listen you can... to it again. Say what you said, and then get rich. <laughs> someone who's very, very um, business savvy and obviously seen a lot. He's what, 90, 96, something, mm. something ridiculous and 
obviously he's seen a lot in this world as well. So look, you can, there's so much you can take from people like that and learn from them um, to implement into your, into your life, whether you go down the same road as them or not, you can, yes. you can, you can put it into your own, your own world for sure. Any wisdom you want to share with all the people listening, anything you've learned, anything you live by? Oh. Any quote you like, anything, something which we said, listen, this is really uh, describes myself, my personality. Um, it's, I sort of touched on it a little bit when you see it, is it talent or, or uh, hard work? Mm -hmm. It's, I, I am quite passionate about the whole hard work thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Good. It, it like really that. does. It does annoy me when someone says mm -hmm. you're just, you're just talented. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things I don't do 100% well. And that's why I don't win every day. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't win as much as some of these other guys, but there's so many days where I'll come home from training And I'll be shaking. I'll be in absolute bits during quarantine, during those Zwift races. Mm -hmm. I would finish them. I'd be on a high because obviously I won. But I was on the couch until I went to bed that night, just feeling sick. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I was sweating, even though the air con, I was sitting in front of the air con. I I'd turn my body inside out to, to get what I got out of myself on, on that ergo. So there's a lot of it and sure I didn't look like I was hurting, but there's mm -hmm. so much pain involved in, in achieving what we achieve as professional athletes. And sure. I don't probably do it as much as what I should to win everything, but there's a lot of days where, there's absolutely no doubt that I could get any more out of my body. Absolutely no doubt. I, I finish and I'm completely empty. And whether you apply that to working for a year and hardly sleep to get your business going, um, mm -hmm. whether like you're an entrepreneur or, or it's a, a side hustle or, or it's something to, um, you want to impress your boss. So you're doing more work on top and, and you're sacrificing going out with your friends. I, I hardly went out on the piss when I was a young kid. I did. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed myself, but there's a lot of things I missed out on in my teenage years. I didn't go to what they call summer break in America yeah. for Australia. I didn't go to it because I had a camp, a training camp that came one week after it and I said, I don't really want to come into it unfit. Um, there's a lot of things I sacrificed to be in the position I am today and everybody can do it. Um, I think it's just about who, who is willing to put in that hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and there's hard work and then there's actual hard work. Um, mm -hmm. Is, sure. I thought I was hitting the limit um, when I was younger and I wasn't even touching it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about boring out my engine, which is what my, uh, my track coach said when I was younger, you just keep, got to keep boring the engine out around, just keep boring it out, just keep digging the hole, keep digging the hole and then hope you can climb out of it. And when you do climb out of it, dig a bigger hole. Um, So it's just, it's about being patient again, being mm. patient that what you're doing will eventually pay off. If you're not enjoying it though, stop. Yeah, true. If you're not enjoying it, there's no point. Why would you do it if you're not enjoying it? The big question I ask is if you, money was not an issue with, uh, with anything, you had all the money in the world, what would you do? And then just go all in on that. Mm, true. Obviously, it's, it's eventually you're going to need money, but if you're enjoying it and you can create a business out of it, you'll get the money. It's that's another side of the, the whole world. But yeah, I think do what you really love and 
the the pain and suffering of it won't seem as bad. That's that's hundred percent sure. <laughs> Very good. Hey, Rowan, listen, I'm I'm conscious of your time, and I think we already went way over the hour. Um, which, 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 but I listen. I, I was excited about the talk, but I think it is, was really, really fantastic to spend to spend the time. And um, I just want to acknowledge you. I think you, you're doing an amazing, amazing thing with, with the cycling, and I think it's great to see you uh, out there on the front, um, riding the, the the whole team bits and pieces. And and I think it's nice to see you on the time trials and um, enjoy your family. I think it's, it's really nice to to talk to you, and and I'm looking forward to see you. Uh, back in Dubai and we wish you obviously a great season and um, yeah I hope that then Ineos Grenadiers will do well in the tour um, I'm sure. thank you we can see some good battles <laughs> appreciate appreciate your time and thanks for having me on Wolfie really thank you very much time. our next guest um, is the master of cycling shoes uh, from Lake Christian von Aston he will be okay. on our next on our next show I thought you were about to say Adam Hansen because he's got uh, his shoes but <laughs> Adam was on the show um, and now he's making his own uh, frame and bike I think I have to get him back on to tell us all about it I think he's a super interesting guy um, very, very and with the shoes and everything super nice guy made me some shoes he's uh, one of my good friends so he's a little bit different he does things differently but someone who I would I would take to the, the trenches with me he's, a, he's an absolute ripper guy Yeah, no, super smart. You know, this was a very good conversation as well. And he knows so much about cycling. I love the, the, the attention to detail. It's a super nice YouTube channel uh, where everyone is into a really nerdy cyclist. That's a really good, uh, a good uh, talk and, and a good thing to watch what he's doing. Really good. Super. <laughs> Regards to your wife and to your family. Yeah. And thanks for the time. Yeah. Cheers. All the best for the rest of the season. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah.